Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. Today, Kyle Bauer talks with Justin Weinheimer, Crop Improvement Director for the United Sorghum Checkoff. Then it's time for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. And then Kyle is back with John Duff, the Strategic Business Director for the National Sorghum Producers. And we hear from Joe and Grant Morgan. They'll tell us why Pokey Feeders is such a successful feed yard. We'll end with this week's Plain Talk. Stay tuned. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Grain Sorghum, growers working together. Find out more at kansasgrainsorghum.org. Welcome to Farm Factor. Let's join Kyle Bauer and Justin Weinheimer as they discuss how checkoff dollars fund research and other program areas. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer. I have the opportunity to visit with Justin Weinheimer. He is with the Sorghum Checkoff directs, I will say, directs research or the research dollars for the checkoff. Is that fair? Yeah, one part of it. Uh, the checkoff has, um, you know, really three investment legs that they look at within the portfolio. Uh, crop improvement is one of those. Uh, we also have renewables market development and uh, most, most recently brought in uh, more of an agronomic focus into crop improvement as well. You know, as we visited, I'm amazed at how much you're able to leverage up the dollars that are available from the checkoff. The sorghum industry is a small industry. How many dollars do you have for research each year and how much are you able to leverage those up? Well, typically, uh, while our budget varies year to year, typically we, we look at about uh, $2 million of investment in, in research and development across those three or four different program areas. I think the board of directors really does look at that at a, as a broad level approach from an investment within that portfolio to really look at those dollars as a leverage standpoint. And, and I think they, they realize that to advance sorghum as a crop, uh, to advance it as a marketable commodity and to bring it into new uses, they really have to understand uh, that, that their dollars act as catalysts. And then also they, they form synergies within the industry, particularly in, uh, within crop improvement within the seed and chemical sectors that develop uh, new sorghum hybrids to bring to farmers' fields. So when they look at those investments and, and they look at the dollars they have available, they're looking for that leveraging, whether it be with a private partner or a public partner. You know, as we visited today with a number of different people, I'm surprised the wide variety of people that are investing money in research, all the way from federal government, state government, uh, private sources, uh, international sources. There's a lot of different places you're leveraging that money up. There is. I think if you look at the, the broad range of investments that uh, the National Board of Directors has made from a checkoff standpoint, uh, you know, they're, they're covering a, a broad range. Uh, we, we recently have some collaboration with the Department of Energy. The uh, Department of Energy has uh, invested uh, about $70 million in some genetic phenotyping and genotyping efforts uh, focused on sorghum. Those are at six locations across the U.S., and the board of directors realized that leveraging opportunity and went in and, and, and pulled $500,000 out of the research investment portfolio and leveraged that money uh, uh, in, in collaboration with the Department of Energy. That's a great example of, of uh, the catalyst and the, and the industry cooperation that can come out of, of the checkoff. You know, we also have additional projects uh, with, with uh, public universities uh, across the nation uh, here in Manhattan at Kansas State is one of the sorghum flagship research universities. We actually have a strong portfolio there from a broad range of crop improvement and marketing activities, as well as other universities across the country. And, uh, you know, while at the same time, uh, we, we have partnerships with uh, many of our private seed and chemical companies from uh, Dow and DuPont and others, uh, really trying to build that momentum within uh, the sorghum industry to, to take it to new heights. We're visiting with Justin Weinheimer. He is with the Sorghum Checkoff. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. 
You can catch KFRM in many ways. Of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at KFRM.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays, and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Buying a car shouldn't be this hard. And at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, it isn't. It's actually awesome. Whether you want a new or used car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. Even if you want to custom order a new car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. See Toby's team at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego. We're awesome. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas Farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. John Ray from Ottawa, Kansas, is the representative for the Kansas Soybean Commission on the U.S. Soybean Export Council. And John, back in mid-October in Des Moines, Iowa, China announced that they were committed to purchasing 5.1 million metric tons of U.S. soybeans that has a value of $2.1 billion. Very exciting news. Yes, it is. And to put that in layman terms, that's rough about 551 million bushels. With that purchase that they had, and then early in September, they were at the Midwest Buyers Conference in Indianapolis, and they also pledged to buy $1.8 billion worth for a total of almost $4 billion worth of U.S. soy. Why is this so important to keep developing this relationship with China? China is the largest market for the U.S. and for the world. They consume the guys that still plant on 30-inch rows, every fourth row, or roughly 25% of the U.S. crop goes to China. And John, as you look at this relationship, there were seven of the top 10 Chinese soybean buyers at the signing ceremony in Des Moines. The Chinese are very committed to uh, U.S. soy. They love it. They also have uh, over a billion people that they need to feed. And as their middle class start getting more and more money in their pocket, the first thing they look to is the protein in their diet. And soy is a very easy way to do that. And John, it really shows about the U.S. soy value chain and their international buyers. In this case, the agreements between U.S. and China, how strong the partnerships have been. And we have many partnerships all around the world, and that's what it's all about. It's more of a people-to-people, and they have to trust you. They have to trust the quality of the product that you produce. And I've traveled the world and the U.S. products by far are the best on the market. But for that Kansas soybean producer, that also means so much opportunity as far as where the Kansas soybean crop is going to be able to go as well. There's uh, more and more facilities coming up that they're uh, loading beans and containers. So that's given uh, the Kansas farmer opportunities to actually export their beans where, let's say, 20 years ago, very few got exported. They more got taken to, uh, you know, a Bungie or a Cargill, and they they ended up uh, getting crushed, and more than likely that meal was being consumed domestically. John, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. That's John Ray from Ottawa, who is the Kansas representative on the U.S. Soybean Export Council Board representing the Soybean Commission, joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break for more Farm Factor with Kyle and John Duff. I will take action against herbicide-resistant weeds. I will know my weeds, and I will stop them before they go to seed. I will do whatever it takes to give my crops the upper hand, and I will use multiple herbicide sites of action because every action counts. I will take action, this time, for all time. 
Tall Grass Commodities offers producers bulk commodities at a reasonable price with reliable service throughout the whole Midwest. To find out more about Tall Grass Commodities, visit tallgrass.us or call 785-494-8484. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. This segment brought to you by SureCrop, liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back with Kyle and John as they discuss sorghum's growing numbers and uses. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer. I have the opportunity to visit with John Duff. He's with National Sorghum Producers, and he is the strategic business director. John, what does strategic business director mean? So uh, I'm the chief economist for National Sorghum Producers. Uh, Get up in the morning and first priority, uh, if there's anything going on, is farm bill. Uh, Priorities after that are renewable fuel standard, uh, California low carbon fuel standard, regulatory policy, uh, particularly as it relates to biofuels. Uh, Also have uh, a role uh, on the sorghum checkoff doing overall ethanol promotion and marketing. You know, it sounds like You spend the lion's share of your time dealing with ethanol issues. Ethanol has been a huge part of the progress for sorghum. Absolutely. Ethanol has been uh, absolutely key in sorghum's history and really bringing back and and facilitating a sorghum resurgence uh, over the past five to ten years. So about a third of the crop. Uh, typically goes into into first generation ethanol, and I can get a little more specific on those numbers, but it's about a third of the crop overall that that goes into first generation ethanol uh, alongside corn, and it's it's absolutely key for grinding through those those excess stocks and uh, making the piles go away. Well, and truly, there is going to be a lot of piles. There is a huge supply this year. Uh, a few years ago, we saw a huge export demand. All of those different things are very political in nature. Oh, they are, absolutely. There's no doubt that there's a a big policy impact, uh, particularly in the Chinese market. But one thing to remember is is that uh, China is a a, a billion and a half people, and that that continues to grow. Uh, And and many of those people are coming into the middle class, and and they want a more American-style diet, and that means more more meat and that means more means more protein demand and so the regardless of the protein source uh, whether that's soybean meal or whether that's uh, distiller's grain uh, or whether that's sorghum uh, they need the protein and then that's going to be very important to them regardless of policy when you talk about policy and politics though it involves everything from research dollars to transportation to trade tariffs all over the world uh, absolutely, it does. It's a it's a very very complicated uh, puzzle to get just right, uh, and it is is all conspired to be very very good for sorghum over the last few years, and we're really optimistic that that continues uh, over the next few to create that demand for for markets that the sorghum industry has really always needed to to really live up to its full potential. Like you said, it uh, that's a great way to put it. Conspired for its success, but it just seems that. That sorghum is very politically correct these days. Uh, it is, uh, no doubt. The sustainability aspects of sorghum uh, are very important uh, from uh, what it does for the soil uh, to what it does for water use. Uh, giving irrigation wells a break, I think that the, the environmental aspects of the crop uh, are very positive for it and, and no doubt help uh, in China and other markets as well. We're visiting with John Duff. John is with the National Sorghum Producers. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Folks, come back after the break to see why Pokey Feeder stands out today as a Kansas feed yard known for quality. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. 
The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. If you're searching for bulls that offer genetic flexibility, then come to the Dale Banks Angus Bull Sale, Saturday, November 19th, near Eureka, Kansas. Selling 140 bulls that have spent their lives in rough Flint Hills pastures. For 112 years, the Perriers have been focused on providing hardworking, balanced trait bulls for progressive cattlemen nationwide. Make plans to join us on November 19th or bid online at liveauctions.tv. Call the Perriers at 620-583-4305 or dalebanks.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor with Joe and Grant Morgan from Pokey Feeders. Pokey Feeders stands out today as sourcing the most and best Angus cattle to help meet the growing demand for premium beef. But in its first years during the 1980s, CEO Joe Morgan didn't see a clear path to industry leadership. Well, I think when I first started, of course, it was more survival. You know, I needed a job, I needed to make money, I had a family to support. That became easier when value-based grid marketing incentivized quality among cattlemen. Everybody thought they had the best steer in the West until they fed them and they really found out what they had. And so as uh, one guy would get a reward of, say, 40 or $50 or $30 in the early days or whatever, and his neighbor's cattle didn't bring the reward, you know, uh, it didn't take very long to people understood they had to improve their genetics if they were going to continue. As the dawning realization that quality pays spread across the beef community, pokey feeders grew by cultivating ties to people who were acting to improve their herds. You know, we're just like a hotel. We have so many pens, so many rooms to utilize. And so as we, you know, started buying cattle for us, you know, we wanted to have the cattle in there that were going to maximize the return to us. And so we wanted to have the higher quality cattle that were able to be gridded and bring back a premium to us. And we were going to generate more total dollars out of the use of that pen. Morgan attributes much of that success to long-term relationships with good people. Those people are also involved in the industry, and so, you know, they're going to be around for a long time, too. And that's what keeps longevity of these companies is when you have, like I said, you know, when we go into second and third generations, those relationships have been built with high-quality people. The veteran cattle feeder's son, Grant, representing the next generation at Pokey Feeders, plans to keep building those relationships. I think uh, to start with, people want to do business with people, and so... It's always been my father's philosophy. Um, we probably differentiate ourselves from other feed yards is that, you know, we do everything we can to make the customers profitable as possible. One way of doing that is finding a continuous supply of cattle that hit the premium targets. I mean, we buy resale cattle. Um, we don't own any of those cattle, especially the ones that are going to make money from day one. We sell those to customers right away. We don't take any of those cattle for ourselves. And that's always been his philosophy, is just to build a customer base that way by taking care of them um, and kind of putting ourselves a second. It all serves to put the beef consumer first, and the Morgans know what's important to families. I have grandchildren too. You know, I, I, I want them to be healthy, and I don't want them to feed them anything or anybody else's grandchildren, something that's not, you know, a good product. Pokey Feeders received the 2016 Feedlot Commitment to Excellence Award at the CAB Annual Conference in September. I'm Bob Cervera. Come back after these messages for Plain Talk. That's coming up next here on Farm Factor. Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. 
played Sutton, Nest City, Kansas. Lived on this place all my life. About a year and a half ago, got to where I couldn't saddle a horse. The pain was terrible. Read about stem cell. First it wasn't for me, then they started doing neck and back. Before I uh, went down to uh, Manhattan, the pain I was having from my neck down to my hand was uh, curling my hand back. Some people had thought I almost had a stroke and my shoulder had drawed up. I, I couldn't lift, I couldn't sleep, I really couldn't do anything and was scheduled to be operated on but was scared of the knife, I guess. Went and had it done. As you can see, I saddled a horse. I'm still building fence. Love to shoot a shotgun rifle, and I'm able to participate. Not like I used to, but nevertheless, I can do the things I used to do. And I want to personally thank the doctors, nurses, staff at Kansas Regenerative Medicine for the opportunity they give me to have my life back again. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. We're back. Let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are up to on this week's Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with Dwayne Taves. Kyle Bauer, your fact or fiction question of the day. Dogs learn by inference to voice command. Fact or fiction? As in they learn what you mean by it. like when you say ask your dog for instance would you like to go for a walk uh -huh. do you really think he knows what walk means or you... does he infer that he's about to get to go for a walk <laughs> it's pretty deep i know don't we all live by inference uh, uh I mean, is that really a picture on the wall or do i uh, are we just inferring that's a picture on the wall <laughs> you're like a different or... picture yeah, uh, I don't really know where I was going with that. Okay, sure, I'll go true. That's, yeah. I think everybody, everything they don't learn learns by what, inference. They don't really learn what the word walk means. No, they know that when they hear that. When they that, hear walk, you walk over and pick up a leash, he's going to get to go outside, and uh -huh. he's going to get to do something he enjoys. Okay, I think we all might live, live, learn by inference myself, but whatever. It's your question, not mine, yeah. but I got it right, and it's a... It's a w, w. One in the W column. Right there in the W. Uh, immigration is a big issue right now. Um, a actually, it's a big immigration most of my life, or big issue most of my life. Okay? All right. And um, the question is, a lot of people think we need to send a lot more people packing. Mm -hmm. Deport them, if you will. Yes. So my question to you, Dwayne Taves, is how many people about a year do we deport? I mean, because it's a big issue. There's a lot of people think we should deport, deport I, more. I, I really don't have a good estimate on that. I know there. I've heard of cases where uh, people have been held at a county jail, uh, law enforcement. Out in our part of the world. And, and have been released because nobody came to pick them up to deport them. So yeah, they say, hey, don't, we don't have a bus available. I don't think we're really deporting that many of them. I'll say... 2,500. 2,500 would be a good guess. That would be low. Um, okay, again, my most recent numbers are 2014. You like that year. Well, that's, the government the, did The too. government likes it. By <laughs> the way, the last this is put out by Pew Research, so this isn't just made up by some guy in a bar. Right. Okay, 414,000. Nearly a half a million deported? Actually, and that's down 20,000 from the year before. Put on a plane or a bus and sent, and sent, packing. sent packing. Now, I think everybody in our part of the world thinks about Mexico sending folks back to Mexico. Right. And but there are others. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got, you've got the dastardly Canadians. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just don't hear a lot about well, them. Well, and truly... We have a lot of people that outstay their visa. They try to get away with it. They get mm -hmm. caught. They apply for a job. They catch them. Ice shows up, and they get put on ice, if mm. you will. So cool them down. What does ice stand for? Uh, I have no. Idea. I know it's the it's the ones when they have it on the back of their shirt when they come into certain places and everybody runs out the back door. <laughs> so immigration and something customs. Um, Customs. Enforcement. Enforcement. There you go. And if How that's not that? it, that ought to be it. It's close enough. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. We're here every Tuesday on Ag AM in Kansas.
closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.